back to Phenomenon Radio Live. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying with us. And it's time for the final segment of the program with our very special guest, Annie Jacobson. Here's John Burroughs. John? Thanks, Race. As we went to the commercial, I read this quote, and I want to read it again because I think this is important to the whole program itself. In her book, she talks about how it really started to ramp up in the early 60s, which a lot of things were going on in the early 60s, too. And we talked about China earlier, but the Soviets played a huge part in this. And the quote was, the discovery of the energy underlying telepathic communications will be equivalent to the discovery of atomic energy. And what I'd like you to go into is a little bit about what the Russians were working on, what you discovered, the documents, where they were heading, what drew the Americans into it, and then that later on it was realized just how far the Americans were behind and there was a race to try to catch up. Yes, well, you know, you've touched upon an important subject in terms of national security because the intelligence community led by the CIA and the Defense Department um, is are always looking to make sure that we don't get left behind, that we don't get outpaced like we did with Sputnik. And the psychic arms race is no different. In the, you know, after World War II, the leading theory was that Marxism, Marxist doctrine, considered things like mysticism, religion, to be an opiate of the opiate of the masses. And so there was this idea that all things that used to be kind of magical and mystical were underground. And then when it emerged in the 60s that the Soviets were working on these programs, uh, there was real concern at the CIA. There had been earlier concern in the 50s regarding the MK Ultra programs, that, um, but this was all on sort of the access of mind control. But now you had this straight out idea that ESP was having a resurgence um, in Russian culture and specifically in military science. And even more threatening to CIA, as I write in the book, was that somehow this was being merged with technology. And that's what the CIA could not figure out. And Putoff, Hal Putoff was one of the scientists who was actually sent um, into the world of investigating this early on, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, and others, to see where the Soviets stood in this research. And what they found, again, really freaked them out. And there's some now famous DOD documents that are written um, that really read very alarmist in their uh, narrative about how, you know, we're going to get left behind and this is going to all be terrible. Correct. And one of the other things that you go into a little bit is about the discovery of individuals being able to move objects with their mind, correct? There was a very famous Russian psychokinesis person. She was kind of like the Uri Geller of Russia, and her name was Nina Kulangina. And she was this beautiful housewife. I mean, interestingly, when she was 15, she was a tank operator in the Battle of Stalingrad. So she was, you know, she had medals on her uniform. Um, But she had since become a housewife and she had this purported ability to move matter with her mind. Um, Some films came out in the late 60s showing Nina Kulingina moving objects like a salt shaker or matches. The way that the film, I've seen the films, they're very interesting. There's kind of like a a glass terrarium over an object. And then Kulingina sits in a chair and she's, you know, kind of moving her, really sort of agitated and you see these things move. And of course, skeptics will tell you that there's ropes and strings and thread involved. But the DOD took this very seriously and they took it seriously for two reasons. They said either this is black propaganda and, you know, they want us to think that they can have these individuals moving matter with their mind, do things like stop the beating heart on a human, um, or she can really do it. And when the DOD saw this film, of Kulingina at a secret laboratory in Leningrad, uh, stopping the excised beating heart of a frog. In other words, the, the 
the frog's heart had been removed and put in this kind of saline type solution that uh, allows it to to beat for up to like one and a half hours. And then there's Kulangina, you know, concentrating on the heart to stop it. And they've got electrodes attached to it and attached to her. And I interviewed um, the man in charge of reviewing this document and writing the report. His name is Dale Graff. He was an Air Force physicist. You know, the, again, the DOD just went wild and said, we cannot let this get out from under us. We cannot let the Soviets take the lead in this area. And we began the programs as well, and a lot of funding was involved. Right. And one of the things that you brought up, it was current, you know, past, current, and, and current um, research and stuff. How much did you learn on what's currently still going on? Well, in the end of the book, I bring the reader forward to the to the present day, and um, this was very surprising to me in my in my reporting of the book because even Putoff and Green and others told me that they were under the impression that the uh, you know the white programs, if you will, had been didn't exist anymore, and they did. White programs being something that you can find about, not a black program you can't learn about until it's been declassified. Um, but the programs I report on the, in the book, which were not really known, are these Office of Naval Research programs born out of the war theater in Iraq, as Linda spoke of in the introduction, where uh, soldiers uh, had sort of premonitions or precognition about an IED buried in an alley ahead of them, stopped their men from going forward, now you have a situation where that soldier becomes super interesting to the Office of Naval Research. Unlike the 1970s, where they get put in a Faraday cage and tested like Uri Geller or Pat Price or Ingo Swan, they're now being looked at by neurobiologists, you know, nanobiotechnologists. These are areas of science that didn't exist 10 years ago. These are areas of science I wrote about in my DARPA book. Um, the question one gets to ask is, will science and technology solve this age-old mystery that we've been talking about for the past hour and a half? Um, will science and technology be able to figure out if ESP is real, if psychokinesis is possible? And if so, what will science and technology tell us about that? Is it energy? Is it something else? And just one insert here quickly is that in uh, the downfall chapter of your book, I was so surprised after feeling like, uh, for example, when James Clapper was a general and that there was this general embarrassment about even the Stargate project of remote viewers who had been so extraordinary and yet, even though James Clapper and the Department of Defense and the CIA took a kind of schizophrenic position to the public that, no, it didn't work, but behind the scenes, it was a different attitude. And you had this statement, it was interesting that General Clapper categorized the Defense Department's ESP and PK research as, quote, leading edge technology. You're absolutely right. You pick out all the greatest lines. I mean, that one went under a lot of people's radars, but it certainly didn't go under mine. I mean, what a remarkable thing to say in 1992. And remember that someone like Clapper, and of course we know him now because he just, uh, you know, stepped down as the director of national intelligence, the DNI, the man in charge, you know, that was overseeing all 17 U.S. intelligence agencies that we know of. That Clapper, so who was obviously cleared on the state of the art technology then and now, made that statement then. And very interesting that he, it's certainly interesting to me, that Kit Green shared with me that it was General Clapper who hand picked him to be on that Defense Intelligence Science Board just last year. And Annie, I want to shift gears a little bit now because. There's a chapter in here that's kind of close to my heart. Chapter 7, Edgar Mitchell. And I'd like you to go into that, but I want to start with this. I have to be careful what I say, but I did before 
Dr. Mitchell passed, was able to talk to him. And all I want to say is this. He was clear with me towards the end of our conversation that the phenomenon in Condine played a part in all of his work. So I'd like you to kind of talk about that chapter and your feelings on Dr. Mitchell. And Condine is the UK UAP report. So Mitchell to me was one of my um, just, you know, favorite people to be able to interview for this book. I mean, I just found him remarkable and I find it really interesting to this day that um, the scientific skeptics, you know, slag him off. And it's just, it's just remarkable to me because I sat and read the 1,150 page report about what went on from the moment Apollo 14 left this earth and went to the moon and what and how that all went down and the rem- talk about extraordinary human functioning ed mitchell has it i mean what a hero he, he it was such a remarkable mission so many problems came about because apollo 14 was after right after apollo 13 they were under this extraordinary pressure to appear as if everything was rosy when in fact there were some life-threatening situations. And I write the short version of them in the book, or you can read the the whole report that NASA has. Um, And, you know, Ed Mitchell came back from the moon having had a conversion experience that he spoke about with me in our interview at length, this idea of realizing that we were so much more, that man is uh, connected to something greater than himself. What a lovely idea. I don't need science to explain that, at least to me. Uh, But of course, again, the ridicule that he faced from scientific skeptics was just extraordinary. And what I liked writing about him was how he persevered and how he stayed dedicated to his pursuit of ESP and psychokinesis separate from when anyone thought of him. And, you know, I just think that's a that's an that's an admirable character trait in someone that commitment to something and and I write about him throughout the book and I I really I have nothing but um fond and extraordinary things to say about the man Annie could you for the audience that may not know can you describe what Edgar Mitchell said to you about what happened to him what did he experience physically and mentally and spiritually Yes. So you got, must back up just a moment to when he was on the moon to get the, the full impact of what happened to him on the way to the moon. At least I think so. And it, part, it has to do with the other reason I wrote Phenomena. And that's because of an image I found in the Apollo image library of a man on the moon reading a document. Um, and that's Ed Mitchell. And the document, Mitchell told me, I went all the way to his home in Florida to find this out, was a map. He was reading a map of the moon on the moon. And the reason he was reading a map was because he and Al Shepard had gotten lost. And this I found remarkable. I mean, getting lost is a great metaphor for everything we've been talking about. You know, some people pursue this mystery to the gates of hell. And, you know, who decides what it means to get lost? But there they were on the moon. They traveled 240,000 miles, hit the target. And then they got lost locally. And what getting lost meant to Mitchell and Alan Shepard was that they couldn't get to their target, Cone Crater, where they were supposed to gather rock samples to bring home to geologists on Earth who told them that these rock samples from Cone Crater might be able to solve the mystery of how old the moon was. I mean, talk about a tall order. And they couldn't do it because they got lost. And they had to go home. I mean, NASA, you know, could read their physiology in real time, saw the heart rates, knew they were running out of oxygen and said, get back to the lander and get yourself off the moon. And they did. So what a disappointment. And that was the whole prelude, Mitchell told me, to, you know, how he felt in the moon. And there he was in the moon. I suppose you could say depressed, certainly upset, disappointed beyond measure. And then he had this moment, which, you know, he says it's so much better, and I quote him in the book, but he had this moment looking out the window where he realized that, 
you know, everything from war to, you know, destroying the environment. This was all, you know, nuts. My words, not his words. Um, and that we were more than this. We were capable of more. We should be doing more. And we should be trying to figure out how we are all connected through consciousness. The universe had the answers Mitchell believed. And that's what he dedicated the rest of his life to study. Do you feel when you talk to him, do you think it took getting outside the EM field of earth and away from man's consciousness that obviously is, we're not doing a very good job. Do you think it took going to the moon and being away from all that that created that effect? I don't know. I mean, look, Mitchell had some very far out ideas. I mean, he talked to me about a lot of things in our recordings and I, I, I part and parceled what, it, you know, our discussion because I was keeping, I wanted to keep my reporting of him on the access of his personal narrative. And I was more interested in what happened to him um, than his analysis of how a lot of this anomalous mental phenomena may or may not work. And so I listened to his theories, but what was much more interesting to me as a reporter was his, you know, his boots on the ground experience, or rather we should say boots on the moon experience. And Annie, I have found on page 115, because I felt, and I know John does too, that what Edgar Mitchell described and what you uh, described in the book, in this fascinating chapter, you say, sitting there in the command module, he experienced what he later described as a, quote, flash of understanding, its full meaning somehow obscured. It was silent and authoritative, but with simple clarity, he understood one universal truth. Man is connected to other men through consciousness, and that was the link between inner space and outer space he felt a peacefulness he had never experienced before. Later, he would identify the feeling as a samadhi, a term from ancient Sanskrit that means perfect oneness with the universe. And at that moment, that oneness, I'm wondering, where do you think, after all the work that you've done, where do you think that the force, the energy in ESP and PK lies? I do not have the answer. What I have is the reporter's experience of relaying to you the different points of view and the different deep understandings of these individuals who have spent decades thinking about it. And I think anything that I would have to say would cheapen that. I mean, look, what you just read, from my book, those quotes from Edgar Mitchell, those are beautiful. I mean, he said it. I find it interesting as a reporter to be able to listen to what those who get to be, you know, the knowledgeable ones based on their commitment to studying these concepts. And again, I hold them, you know, part and parcel with other people's opinions about things, including the scientific skeptics, including the British mathematician who says, you know, there's nothing miraculous about anything, any of this. It can all be explained through numbers. I hold that idea as well, because for someone like myself, I'm interested in uh, looking at all the different pieces of the puzzle. And maybe when I get older, I'll be able to have an answer. And what do you think that uh, Dr. Mitchell thought he might be able to do by founding the Noetic Institute? Well, the way he described it to me was he wanted to have a research foundation to be able to, um, you know, hire researchers to investigate um, from an analytical point of view and also from a laboratory point of view. I mean, what was also remarkable about Mitchell was that he was one of the first, as I write in the book, he was one of the first fronts for the CIA. And that really got things going. Edgar Mitchell was single-handedly responsible for Uri Geller being brought to the United States from Israel 
to be tested by the CIA at SRI. And Mitchell was kind of the hidden hand in all that. Another remarkable thing about him was that he, when sometimes when they would sort of run out of funds, Mitchell would get sent to CIA. He told me a great story, which I was able to confirm in declassified documents about meeting with George H.W. Bush when he was CIA director to try to get some more money because, of course, he was a hero. Right. I was just going to say it's interesting that President Bush made that statement during his son's last run that we couldn't handle the truth if we knew what the truth is. And the fact that Dr. Mitchell was working with inside the CIA and then CIA Director Bush on getting more funds for this particular project. So it's clear that he was aware of this project. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, there's documents that show that um, George H.W. Bush was aware of the of the ESP and the psychokinesis program. Absolutely. But, you know, in on balance, he could have been referring to many, many things. I mean, it is often said in the national security world that I report on that George H.W. Bush, having been CIA director and president and vice president, probably knows more and was cleared on more black programs than any single individual in the nation's history. What do you suspect he meant that if the public were told the truth, they couldn't handle it? Well, I would guess that refers to many things. I mean, this is a central organizing theme of all four of my books. Um, In Area 51, in the last 10 pages, I reveal something that, you know, I was told even the president didn't have a need to know. In Operation Paperclip, I was able to write about DOD programs and reveal that we absolutely knew that several of the German scientists that were brought here under Operation Paperclip were con- were wanted for war crimes, and we overlooked that. Those are documents that Harvard University helped me have declassified. In DARPA, my book, The Pentagon's Brain, and I write about programs that, you know, were not supposed to see the light of day, but did, and I think they shock people, and certainly the same in phenomena. So the idea of the public can't handle the truth, the only difference between me and George H.W. Bush would be that I think the public can handle the truth. I think the truth is very interesting, and I think people, certainly ones who are willing to read really long books, can handle it. And I hate to cut you off, but we're out of time. This is probably one of the most fascinating interviews I've ever been involved with. Yes. And I want to thank you for coming on tonight. Yes. And add, the people are owed the truth. Annie, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. 